House of the Lord. Amen. 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 We all look good. We also welcome everybody that's viewing now live. We're right now live on Thursday night with you, and we're glad to have you. We're getting ready to get right into the Word of God. We call this uh, our Bible study night. Amen. And so we're going to dig in and look into some chapters and verses in the name of Jesus. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this, another opportunity to meditate your word. Your word, O oh God, is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway. We ask you to shine the light of your word to us tonight by your Holy Spirit. Help us to see it. Help us to get it. Your word for us in the name of Jesus. We pray like Paul prayed for the church. He prayed that his speech and his preaching would not be with the enticing words of man's wisdom, but that they would be in demonstration of your spirit and of power, so that their faith would not rest in the wisdom of a man, but in the power of God. We ask that tonight, that we would experience you through your words. Speak to our hearts individually how this message applies to our lives, that we may be doers of the word and not hearers only. We thank you for it. In the wonderful, marvelous name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Turn with me in your Bible to the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, once again. We're continuing on our series that we've called Faith Experiences. And we want to look at tonight the book of Hebrews chapter 8, excuse me, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8 through 10. And we're going to skip verse 11 because we'll get that next week. And we want to look at verse number 12. <clears throat> of course, Hebrews chapter 11 is the Faith Hall of Fame. And we have it recorded because we are required by God to live by faith. But not only that, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So I don't know about you. I want to learn about faith. Right, right. Well, there were notable individuals in Scripture that lived their lives by faith, and we've been looking at them through this chapter one by one. And tonight we look at Abraham. The title of the message is Abraham Obeyed by Faith. Verse 8 says this. <clears throat> by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive after an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. Very interesting. Verse 9 goes on to say that by faith he dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs of him of the same promise. For he waited, you could say, by faith, for the city which, which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And then in verse 12 about Abraham, it says, Therefore from one man, this one man Abraham, and him as good as dead, were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand, which is by the seashore. Amen. So we're talking about faith experiences, and I just want to redefine what a faith experience is. A faith experience is a moment in time where you experience God in a supernatural way, and it leaves you firmly persuaded. A faith experience is, is a time in your life, and we've all had that whether it be through the word that was preached it was like a message that it was speaking directly to us. There have been times where we've been reading in the Bible and it seemed like those words fit our situation to a T and we believe that through that message in the scripture, though it was about somebody else, it was about us and we experience God in that moment. A faith experience simply is, is when we experience God in a supernatural way. Right. And it leaves us firmly persuaded. Amen. It doesn't leave us in doubt. It doesn't leave us confused. It doesn't leave us afraid. Right. We are firmly convinced we are going to be all right. It could be a peace that shows up right in the midst of a storm. Right. That is what a faith experience is. Now, we're doing this. We're looking at these faith experiences so that in our own lives, we can learn to connect the dots. Mm -hmm. 
It's not intended for you to have victory in your childhood, but now you wonder about the next victory that you need in life. No, that victory in your childhood is used to show you that God came through for you then, and he will do it again, praise God. And so it's so important for us to connect those demonstrations of the Spirit in our lives. We know that those demonstrations of the Spirit were defined for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4, all the way through verse 11, where Paul talked about there's different ways that the Spirit of God, that God, will manifest himself in your life. And matter of fact, there's nine gifts of the Spirit or manifestations of the Spirit or demonstrations of the Spirit categorically. And every experience that any of us could ever have is going to fall in one of those nine. Even in the Old Testament, it'll be seven out of nine, barring two, but even in the Old Testament, when we look at individuals' lives, when they have encountered God in a supernatural way and it left them firmly persuaded, we can find which one of those uh, manifestations uh -huh. they experience. Amen? Amen? So we're connecting the dots along that line. I want to talk to you tonight about obeying God by faith. Amen. I'm going to talk to you about you, not Abraham. We're going to use Abraham as an example. But I want to talk to you about you obeying God by faith. Now, this past Sunday, I know it's a different series, but it, the, the, the two series go together. We talked about whatever he says, do it. Yes. Well, when you do what he says, you are obeying him. Right. Mm -hmm. So this is like part two of that. Amen. So I want to talk to you about when God says something, when the Lord speaks to your heart, I want to talk to you about you obeying him by faith. <laughs> Amen? Amen? And the Bible uses Abraham as an, as an example. In other words, it's about us doing whatever he says, being firmly persuaded while we're doing it. In other words, we're doing it by faith. And again, when you do something by faith, that means you don't have proof. Amen. You're not sure you believe. Amen. So we're talking about obeying God by faith. Right. Amen. Amen. So what makes this message important is the fact that disobedience in our lives opens the door to the devil. Wow. Yes. I heard that like I didn't hear it audibly. But I remember I, I think I made like a U-turn on Highway 6 just finished picking something up and and I'm headed back home, and it just came to me so clearly, disobedience opens the door to the devil. Amen. And this was before it became super clear that we would be talking about, I knew we'd talk about Abraham, but I didn't know we'd be talking about Abraham obeyed, and about obedience in our own individual's lives. Tonight's message is seriously important because when we don't do what he says, we unlock the door for the devil to come in and cause trouble in our lives. Wow. Amen? Amen. 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 So let's, let's delve into this. Now, <clears throat> uh, there's three things that we're going to see tonight that Abraham did. Number one, Abraham obeyed. Number two, Abraham stayed. And number three, Abraham Waited. What verse 8, 9, and 10 are talking about is that he obeyed by faith. He stayed where he was supposed to be by faith. And he waited also by faith. My question as we go through this tonight is can you obey God by faith? Can you go where he tells you to go without knowing? Can you function on a need-to-know basis? <laughs> or are you an individual uh, that cannot function on a need? -to I need to know before I go. Right. What is this going to look like? What do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? I need to get the whole picture before I sign up for what you're telling me to do, God. Can you go without having the complete picture? Next question I want you to consider tonight, can you stay where you're supposed to be? Can you stay in a marriage? Can you stay on a job? Can you stay in a place 
where God tells you to be by faith. That means you have no proof that this person will ever be anything different than what they are right now. You've got no proof that there's promotion coming on this job, although you believe that there's a higher level, that you should be doing more, that you have the capacity of greatness. Can you stay where you are by faith? And lastly, can you wait by faith? We're going to see these played out in his life beginning in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 8. Verse number 8 again, it says this. By faith, Abraham what? Obey. When he was called to go out, God told him to go to a certain place. He said, go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And notice he went out not knowing. Some of us function on a I need to know basis. In other words, I don't go until I know. I'm not okay. You know, Pastor, you're telling me the things and this and that and the other, but, you know, I need to know, if I'm going to put the time in, I need to know that this person is going to, I need to see proof. Matter of fact, I need to see some change now <laughs> before I continue to believe. Abraham, the beautiful part about his story is that when, eight, when God told Abraham to go, he didn't even tell him where to go. He said, go to a land that I will show you. We'll look at that in a moment. But notice that when he went, when he left, wherever he was, he went not knowing for sure where he was going. Amen. Man, this message is going to be great tonight. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we're, we're going to one look at that Abraham obeyed. Now, we don't get the full picture of this by looking at what, 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 what the writer in Hebrews is talking about. We can actually go look at the story when it began. So we're going to actually go back to the book of Genesis, and we're going to even look at the first mention of Abram's name. Y'all are Bible students, right? So we can kind of delve into the scripture. Go with me to Genesis chapter 11. So we're going to see the first time Abram's ever mentioned in the Bible. Y'all know the Bible has a lot of genealogies. Well, in Genesis eleven twenty seven, this is the genealogy of Terah. Terah begot Abram, Naor, and Haran. These are three boys born to one father, Terah, and Haran begot Lot. That would make Lot Abram's nephew, his brother's son. Well, Haran, his brother, the son of Terah, brother of Abraham, died before the Indians come from. Then Abram and Nahor, remember their brother Aaron, died. They both took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, later became Sarah. And the, the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. And the daughter of, now, now notice, uh, Nahor married his niece, the daughter of Aaron, the father of Milcah, the father of Iscah. I guess they had a different code back then. <laughs> Next verse. But Sarai, so Nahor got married and they started having children. But Abram and Sarai didn't have any children, though they were married. As a matter of fact, she was barren. And she had no child. Verse 31 says, Now Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot and the son, the son of Aaron and his daughter-in-law Sarai and his, his sons Abram's wife, that's Sarai, and they went out from Ur of the Chaldeans to the land of Canaan and they came to Haran and dwelt there Period. Next verse. So the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. So there in the land of Haran, uh, Abram and Nahor living with their dad or in the vicinity there. They're growing up there. They're, they're, they're raising their children there. Well, Abram and his wife didn't have children, but, you know, that's where they were at at this point. Now, understand, when the Bible was written, it wasn't written in chapter and verse. So though it ends in chapter 11, verse 32, it begins in chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord has said to Abram, get out of your country, get away from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. Pause right there for a moment. I want you to take this verse in. Because in verse 32, it just painted the picture. And then in verse 1, it says, now the Lord had. Somebody say had. Amen. Now the Lord had said. That means at some point in the past, God spoke to Abram. Doesn't tell us when, but at some point in the past. Now, this came up in my heart because God has told some of us some things in here since the time we were children. 
He spoke to us about our lives, particularly about the calling on our lives from the time we were a child. The reason why I bring that up is because the Bible says in Romans chapter 11, I believe it's verse 29, that the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. They're without repentance. The word calling comes from a Greek word, invitation. In other words, God invited Abraham to do something. And anytime God it, uh, tells you to do something, essentially, he is inviting you to do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Why? Because you have choice. You do not have to obey God. You can choose to do something different. You can choose to do what he says. So God called to Abram, inviting him to do this, and no matter what point he did that, the gift and calling, invitation, the word spoken, doesn't go away. Could have been months, could have been years, but what we have to acknowledge is until he does it, God doesn't say anything else. Some of you have failed because he's not going to tell you something new about your marriage because you didn't do the last thing that he told you to do. Amen. Not going to tell anything new about this job until you do the last thing he told you about this job. Same thing, money, health, children. Right. Praise God. Second thing I need you to note about this, the Lord said something to him. The reason why that's important is because this is a manifestation. He's experiencing God in a supernatural way. Think about how powerful that is for God to speak to you and you to understand that it's God speaking to you. He knew that it was the Lord that said this. Amen. Amen. But that also ties us to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, meaning this experience falls into one of those nine manifestations. Now, remember, I told you, there's three gifts that do something, three gifts that reveal something, and three gifts that say something. Anytime you see God say something in, a, in the earth to us, to anybody, he's going to use one of these three gifts to do it. What are they? Prophecy, diverse kinds of tongues, interpretation of tongues. Now, God's kinds of tongues, interpretation of tongues are germane to the New Testament. So you're not going to see that experience in the Old Testament. You will see it in the New Testament. So anytime God speaks in the Old Testament, he spoke by prophecy. Mm -hmm. Prophecy is very simple. It's a, soup, it's a, it's a divine, a divinely inspired utterance in a known tongue, right. in a language that you can understand. In other words, God speaking directly to you. How many of y'all know that's divinely inspired? He inspired it, amen, and he's speaking it directly to you, but he could anoint a man. He spoke through a donkey. Come on. He could speak through a lot. Right. That's what prophecy is. Well, we're seeing Abraham, ha Abram have a faith experience. Now, every time you have an experience with God in a supernatural way, it's supposed to leave you firmly persuaded. Well, we know that he was firmly persuaded because at the end of his story, the Bible says that by faith, he obeyed what God said. So let's see what else we can see. So he says to Abram, get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. He didn't show him in advance. He said, I want you to leave and go to a place, and, and, and along the way, I'll show you where I want you to go. Mm. For some people, no, no, God, I need you to give me a little bit more than that. Oh, I'm preaching good tonight. You can have an unction just to, I feel sense that I'm led to go in this area, but, but you cannot obey simply because you want more. You want to do it by proof and not by faith. Oh, my ah. Too often we want God to prove his word to us yeah. where he's wanting us to live by faith and be pleasing to him. That's right. I almost have to calm down because I'm so excited about this word. Amen? Amen? Amen. But we keep going. What else did God say? God said to him, I'll make you a great nation. I will bless you. I'll make your name great and you shall be a blessing. Verse 3, he says, I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And listen to this. And in you, this is God speaking, this is by prophecy, and in you, all, the word all means everything, leaves out nothing. In you, all the families of the earth. Now, do we have any families in here tonight? Yeah. I see the Brian family, I see the Henderson family, <laughs> Amen. the Scott family is here, Amen. the whole family. 
brand new members to the church. Welcome. Amen. <laughs> they just finished their membership this past week. So many families are here. So we're a part of the families of the earth. And he said, in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed because of you. Isn't that powerful? Yes. Now guess what that is? That's not just prophecy. Remember, there's three gifts that say something, three gifts that do something, and then there's three gifts that reveal something. This goes beyond just a divine inspiration. This is a word of wisdom. A word of wisdom, like a word is a fragmentary part of a sentence, a word of wisdom is a fragmentary part of the mind of God. How many of y'all know the mind of God is wisdom? Everything he has is wisdom. A word of wisdom is a fragmentary part of the mind of God concerning events, future tense. He's telling him something nearly 4,000 years ago that's taking place even to this day. He's telling him something. What? He didn't even have any kids. But he's telling him he's going to have kids. And his kids are going to have kids. And in, in him, through him, all the families of the earth are going to be blessed. So he's experiencing God, one of these demonstrations of the Spirit in a supernatural way, and it should leave him firm and persuaded. Now let's read it. Verse 4. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 4, it says, So Abram departed... As the Lord had spoken to him, Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he was in the park. Now notice, he did what he was told. He didn't know where he was going. Where are you going, Abram? Well, the Lord, God, creator of heaven, has called me to go to a land that he's going to show me. Well, where are you going? I mean, did he tell you what that land is? No, I don't know, to be honest. He just told me to go and that he would show me a land that he's going to give to me and to my children after me. That sounds crazy. Faith does sound crazy because it's not based on what you see. Right. Amen. So he departed as the Lord has said. What did he do? He did what we learned on Sunday. Whatever he says, what? Do it. Whatever he says, what? Do it. Do it. Amen? So he obeyed. So by faith, he obeyed, not knowing where he was going. So Abram departed. He took Sarai's wife, Lot, his brother. Now, he did not fully obey here. In other words, he disobeyed God because he said, get away from your family. Now, you and your wife are one, so God will never call you to leave your wife. Right. <laughs> your wife never comes before God. Right. Amen? Amen. So you never have to choose between God and your wife. You always choose God. But you never leave your wife saying that God told me to leave. <laughs> he sees you as one. So if he tells you to do it, then she's got that same assignment. Amen? He took his wife, but he took his nephew. He told him, get away from your family. And the reason why I point this out is disobedience opens the door to the devil in your life. He ended up in a world of trouble because of his nephew. That's right. Amen. Amen. To his wife, to his son. Took all his possessions, which was cool, and gathered, took all the people that he acquired in Haran. These are servants, men servants, maid servants. And they departed to go into the land of Canaan, so they came to the land of Canaan. So you think, okay, you know, we're on our way. We're going to go in this direction. When Haran wasn't far from Canaan. It was in that direction. He says, all right, I'm going out. He gets to the land of Canaan. Next verse, and he passed through and the land to the place of Shechem. I imagine that when he got to Shechem, he's like, okay, I know the Lord is going to tell me to do something. He told me he's going to show him. Look at the Shechem, and Shechem is not it. What happened? Then he went through Shechem as far as the temperate tree of Mora. He gets to Mora and he's like, mm, I don't know. This doesn't seem like it, but I'm going. Still, he, come on, y'all. Y'all help me go a little bit faster tonight. He is going, not knowing where he's going. But how many of y'all know God is leading him and God said, I'll show you. Right. When you get there, you will know. And sure enough, he kept going. To, and, and the Canaanites were in that land, verse 7. And, and then he got to a place where then, somebody said, then. Yeah. What is he doing? He's walking this out by faith. You know, there's something about 
the audacity of faith that will cause you to step out over an aching void of nothingness only to find that God will meet you every step of the way. You want the whole plan. You want to see the destination. And you want to see the details. You want to map quest uh, Google Maps people that kind of read all the lists. You can't just go by what she says. I got to see the next turn. And then we're going to turn. I don't know about that turn. He'll direct your steps. The steps of a good man, of a good woman. Come on. Our order. The steps. Somebody say steps. The steps are ordered of the Lord. Take this step and he'll show you the next. So then the Lord appeared. Let's talk about that for a moment. He spoke to Abram at some point and told him what to do and spoke by a word of wisdom to him. But now, because of his obedience, something greater happens. The Lord now appears to him. He appears. That means you can see. He's now having a vision of the Lord. Like this. Let's plug that again. We've got to connect these to the demonstration of the Spirit, manifestation of the Spirit. Remember I said there's three gifts that say something, three gifts that do something, and three gifts that reveal something. Every time you see God move in the Bible, it can be tied to one of these <coughs> manifestations of the Spirit. Well, there's three that, that are manifestations of the Spirit. Reveal. A word of wisdom, word of knowledge, we covered part of that. But the discerning of spirits is the third of the revelation gifts. Brother Hagin taught us very clearly the discerning of spirits is simply seeing into the realm of the spirit. It is not the spirit of discernment. It is just simply the Holy Spirit giving you in a moment the ability to see beyond the natural. He's having that kind of experience. I mean, we can look around right now and not see God, but then if the Holy Spirit gave us a manifestation, we can see that there's angels all in this room right now. Amen. Amen. If we go beyond this room, because demon spirits are not allowed in here, don't get flaky and fruity. Well, I saw a demon the other day. And, uh, I'm, I might cast the devil out of you for saying that. It's just simply seen into the realm of the spirit. There's good spirits, there's bad spirits. Now, Abraham, uh, uh, the Lord appeared to him and said, so now you got two things happening. Not only do you have a manifestation of the discerning of the spirits, you also have prophecy happening, a divinely inspired utterance in an own tongue. He says, to your descendants, I will give this land. He's again talking about a future tense. It's not happening now. He doesn't have any children now. But he's saying, I'm showing you a fragmentary part of my mind. I'm going to give your kids this land, this land that you see right here, right now. This is the place that I told you to go that I would show you. Are you all getting anything out of yeah. This is powerful. Let me hurry. What did he do? And there he built an altar to the Lord. You know, Pastor Andre Butler, the pastor now of Faith Experience Church, he was here on July the 15th. And of course, we've got the Facebook Live video recorded. The message title was, He's Waiting on You. But what he ministered really set me on the path that I'm on today. He talked about what faith experiences are. He used the example, you ever heard X marks the spot? Yes. And he used the story of Jacob, Jacob's ladder. Jacob built an altar after that experience. Yes. Why? So that every time he passed that altar, those stack of stones, it would remind him he had an experience with God. Abram, before Jacob, amen, his grandfather, had an experience with God, and he marked the spot. I really need to challenge you. When you whether it be little things or big things, if you just have an unction, move this cup before it falls. Or you're standing there talking with somebody, and they're talking, 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 and you see they're about to knock the cup off the table. 
You just have an unction. They're going to knock that cup off the table. When they knock it off, if you don't move it for them, I thank God because some people move it for me. <laughs> but if for whatever reason you didn't have that opportunity to move that before it happened and they knock it off, you need to X mark the spot. This, it, it's bigger than just a cup. Yeah. They can get another cup. But God is trying to lead you and teach you how he ministers to you, how he speaks to you, so that when he shows you or does some big thing, right. you won't be confused. You'll know that that's God. Why? Because he showed me in a small thing that yeah. the phone was about to fall, and it fell, and now I know that's the unction of the Lord. Yeah. 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 All right. He built an altar. Somebody say amen. In your life, the demonstrations of the spirit Abraham did. All right. So, uh, next slide for me. His obedience by faith resulted in more faith. He had an experience with God where God spoke, and he went by faith. And sure enough, God showed up. And when God showed up, he's having a faith experience. And a faith experience always results in you being firmly persuaded. So now you're going from faith to faith to faith. Now that's what that scripture means. That we are supposed to go from glory to glory. Come on, y'all. And from faith to faith. From one faith experience to the next. And when you are obedient in the small things... God can trust you with the big things. If you're not obedient to tithe on $2,000 a week, come on somebody, or that's great if you make that in a week, or, or $4,000 in a month, if you're not faithful to tithe on that small thing, who can tr commit to your trust hundreds of thousands or even millions of dollars? I have such a strong unction in my spirit that such growth and increase is coming to Faith Family Church that we need to prepare now to be able to minister to thousands, not just hundreds as we are right now. And not only deal with hundreds of thousands of dollars as we are right now, but to literally be prepared, prepared now to be able to handle millions of dollars. Listen, if I as the pastor of this church are not faithful to tithe on the offerings that are given to the church at three hundred or four hundred thousand dollars in a year, why should I expect that or why should God expect that I would be faithful to tithe on four million or forty million dollars in a year? Come on, somebody. His obedience by faith resulted in more obedience. That tell uh, in more faith. And that tells us that obedience is important. How many of you have ever heard that obedience is better than sacrifice? Yes. Doing something other than what he said. When you sacrifice, that means you're doing something other than what he said. For example, in 1 Samuel chapter 15, I've got to hurry, I've just got about five minutes left. So, amen, we'll get it, we'll go on to the next, amen. <laughs> So Samuel said, has the Lord great delight? Is the Lord pleased in burnt offerings and sacrifices? You don't remember the story. God told him to kill everything. He kept some things. And he's, he's going excuse me, he's going to sacrifice some of those things he kept right. unto the Lord. He, he's, he's given a sacrifice to God. And, he, and the prophet asked him, is he pleased with you doing something other than, yeah, Lord, I'm giving, I'm serving, I'm doing this. But that's not what he told you to do. Right. Yeah, I'm tired. I'm giving my offerings, but he told you to go to greatness class. Ooh, got <laughs> he told you to serve in this capacity. He told you to stay put in this particular area. He still he told you to do something. Yeah, Lord, I'm giving my tithe. I'm giving my offering, but I'm still struggling. Why? Let me ask you a question. Has the Lord great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Question mark. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. Verse 23. For rebellion, meaning not obeying or disobedience, is as a sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness, which is refusing to do what you're told is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you. Come on. Lord, help Amen. me get this out. Obedience is better. Put the next slide. Obedience is better. Submission 
is better. But rebellion is bad, and stubbornness is just as bad. Come on, Disobedience opens the door to the devil in your life, and that's what causes us the trouble. It's so important to do whatever he says do. But notice, how do you do it when you don't have proof that it's him that's even saying it? You do it by faith. Amen. You have to, faith is a firm persuasion. If it's not firm, it's not faith. You don't tentatively do it. You do it. Hey, if I miss it, I'm going to miss it. But I'm going to step out. I'm going to believe. What am I? I'm firmly persuaded that I heard from God to do this. And notice, it's a persuasion. It's not proof. Right. You won't have the confirmation or the assurance in the natural. He'll confirm it in the spirit. But you won't have it in the natural of the thing. Well, I want to see her act this way. I want to see him do that. Well, if he changes how, then I'll. Come on, that's a bunch of bunk. And baloney, what you're doing is looking on what you can see, not on what you can't see. Faith goes by what it believes. We walk by faith and not by what we see. Let's go to the next passage for me. Amen. My alarm just went off. I just have to wrap this up. Um, oh, did I miss that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. This is good. So let me give you the second one. The second one. Abraham stayed by faith. Some of you are in some difficult situations, whether it be in a marriage or on a job. Um, some, of, some of you are in some difficult situations financially, and God's telling you to stay put. You know, don't take out that payday loan. <laughs> you're tempted, man. You're tempted to borrow and you're tempted to, to do, you know, do some things underhandedly, tempted to, 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 to do some things. I'm just going to leave it at that. Amen. <laughs> and he's telling you, stay put. Because the Bible says in verse 9 that by faith he dwelt. The word dwell means to stay. My question to you is, can you stay or dwell in a temporary place? Go back to that one for me. I'm sorry, I mixed them all up. I don't have uh, can you stay or dwell in a temporary place or a temporary condition by faith? This is almost too deep right here. And I'm going to define for you why. Let's look again at the scripture. The question is, can you stay or dwell in a temporary condition by faith? I really want you to consider that. Because that job you're working in the perspective of God is not the reason why you were born. That's temporary yeah. in, his, in his mind. That's right. It's temporary. Thank you, Lord. But can you stay in that tip, that house that you live in right now? But it's my dream house! <laughs> it's temporary. Your dream house is the one that Jesus is in. Amen. Amen. That, that, that apartment, that rental situation, that car you're driving, that situation that you're dealing with in that relationship, that child, it's a temporary condition. Question is, can you stay in that temporary condition, my faith? I'm here to tell you, Abraham did. Um, can you go back to Hebrews 11 and 9? I'm sorry, I mixed them all up. Um, it says that by faith, Abraham dwelt in the land, in a foreign country, dwelling in tents. Now, he's in the land of promise. He's where God told him to be, but it's a temporary condition. There are inhabitants in that. He doesn't even have a child in that land. Notice it dwells in a tent. A tent is the most temporary yeah. condition. Uh, yeah. Some of us could not live in a tent. I could. <laughs> a, few guys, a few guys kind of popped up. And I could live in a tent. Some women are like, oh no. I see you when you get past the tent stage. <laughs> I'm going, I'm going to stay with mama. <laughs> and, you, and you can just mix this right into relationships. All right, next scripture. And I, I apologize. It, it, this is so phenomenal. 2 Corinthians 4.16 came up in my heart. Therefore, we do not lose heart in our temporary conditions. Even though our outward man, things going on, on around us, is actually going in the wrong direction, perishing, 
Our inward man is being renewed day by day. Every time we read and meditate that chapter, the Spirit of God is breathing life. I know the thoughts that I came towards you to give you a future and a hope. Great things are coming. There are things right now so big in my heart about the call of God on my life that it almost seems impossible to contain it. But amen, he gives us that capacity to expand. Amen. God's got big things planned for your life and future. For our light affliction, in other words, what we're going through right now, he considers a light affliction. Some of us, we feel the heaviness of it. Oh, burden down, Lord, burden down, Lord, since I lay my burden down. I mean, some of us feel so heavy under the weight of depression. You need to flip your perspective because God says what you're dealing with right now, no matter how hard, heavy it is, could be the death of a loved one, could be a financial turmoil, could be a turmoil in relationship, you name it. It could be so heavy, but he calls that light affliction. I know in my life there's some things going on. Heavy, but no, they're just a light affliction. Amen. What does he say about it? He says this light affliction, which is but for a moment, it's temporary. What does it for a moment mean? The situations that we're dealing with, can we be, can we stay in those temporary conditions by faith? Meaning, can we be firmly persuaded that we're coming out on the other side yeah. in the right way? That's right. Amen. It's actually working for us. That difficulty is actually setting you up for a promotion. Far more exceeding eternal way to glory, verse 18. While we do not look at the things which are seen. See, the reason why we can call it a light affliction is because we're not looking at the things that are seen. But if you look at the things that are seen, even the doctor's report, even the x-ray, even the symptoms, even the, the spouse, even the bank account, if you keep looking at the things that are seen, it's not going to be a light affliction, which is temporary. <laughs> you think this is heavy and everlasting. Come on. Uh, yeah. we, he says the reason why we can call it light is because we do not look at the things which are seen. See, faith doesn't look at the things which are seen. It looks at the things that are not seen. But the things which are seen are what? Temporary. Yeah, that job's temporary. There's a promotion. There's an advance. There's something bigger and better coming that's promised you. But the things which are seen are eternal. I got to hurry. Again, I would love to minister to this, but we got to get through. <clears throat> In Genesis 15 and 1, how did 2 Corinthians 4 apply to Abram? Okay. Well, after this thing, now we were in Genesis 12 when God appeared to him and said, well, he dwelt in the land. He's staying there, staying there year after year, chapter after chapter. And we get to chapter 15. And these things, the word, and he said, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Two things, prophecy, discerning of spirits. He sees in the realm of the spirit, he hears the word of the Lord, and he says, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield and exceedingly great reward. What's the result of an experience with God? It's supposed to be a firm persuasion. But notice, he has a problem. But Abram said, Lord, what will you give me seeing I go childless in the heir of my house in Eleazar is Damascus? You told me three chapters ago that I was going to have children, and my children will have children, and it's not happening. So I'm starting to be weakened in my faith. Uh, he says, you know, what have you given me? And then Abraham said, look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. Verse 4, he says, behold, the word of the Lord came unto him a second time, saying, again, this is prophecy. What's the result of an experience with God? It's supposed to leave you firmly persuaded, not confused. The first manifestation left him with questions, but he stayed there with God in that experience, and God spoke again and gave him clarity. It's okay to ask God questions, but it's not okay to question God. That's right. Thank you. He's just asking questions, not questioning God. God, you got to help me here because I ain't got kids, and this boy is not really my own, and if I die, and this, I mean, come on, God, give me a little bit more, right? So he's asking God for clarity, and the word comes to him a second time. This one shall not be your heir, but one will come from your own body. He shall be your heir. His wife is like 75, 80 years old. He's 90 years old. 10 years after that, at age 99, and she was 
was 90 years old, then by faith she conceived. Amen. But notice how did he get them to not look at the things that are seen? He took them outside. In this faith experience, he took them outside. He says, mm, I know what you mean. You're looking at what you can see. You're looking at the air. Man, this is good. He said, you're looking at the air of your house. Some of y'all are like, I don't see no man in a faith family church. I don't see, uh, matter of fact, even outside of faith family church, there's just no good men nowhere. See, you're, you're looking at the things that you can see. See, you don't need men. You just need amen. Amen. <laughs> You just need one. And he can get it to you. Oh, absolutely. He, he can bring you somewhere. He can get it to you. But some of us are not firm in our persuasion about our future marriage. We're not firm, firmly persuaded, right? We need to do what happened here. Not look at the things that are seen, but look at the things that are not seen. So to help him, he takes him outside. He says, look now toward heaven. Just look up at him. Abraham. He looks up. And he says, all right, count the stars. Okay, well, I'm looking at the stars. Count them if you're able to number them. No, I can't number them. And he said, by prophecy, so shall. This is a word of wisdom. He's telling him what his future is going to be. What's supposed to be the result of that? He's supposed to be firmly persuaded. Amen? Amen. Can you stay? Don't look at what you see. Stay. Stay in that situation. Don't look at what you see. Look at the things that are not seen. For the things that are not seen are eternal. Amen? Amen. Amen. Then number three. Oh, God wants to show you what your future looks like so that you can be okay to dwell in the temple. He has shown me what the future of Faith Family Church looks like. Amen. So, I'm okay to be in this temporary building. Amen. In this temporary situation. Because he's shown, I mean, he's shown visions. Visions. That's huge. The third thing is Abram waiting, and we're going to cover this on Sunday, because we're going to be talking about faith works by patience. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Facebook, for joining us live tonight. Come on, put your hands together for everybody who's joining us. We love you. Share this with somebody if you enjoyed it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.